Welcome to Ask the Admin, brought to you by Ide Bailey. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about click automations. Today, I'm Frederick Barron. I'm a technical architect with Ide Bailey. And with me here today is John Jones. He is a solution architect with Ide Bailey. As we go through this webinar, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the questions box, and we will ask, answer those as we go through the webinar. Um, feel free to ask any question you have, whether it's on uh, our today's topic or any question you have about Salesforce. We will try to get those answered for you. Also, as we go through this webinar, we will be asking you questions in the form of polls. So we're going to throw one up right now to show you how that works. So what color is the Spring 16 logo? Just select the, the answer that you think is the right one and click Submit. All right. It looks like we've got a good mix of results here. 40% said white and black, 40% said black and blue, and 20% said a butterfly. It is a butterfly. The question was the color, and the color is black and blue. So if you answer black and blue, you are correct. All right. So we're going to go on a little trip on our webinar. So our itinerary today is we're going to have an interactive webinar. As we just showed you, we will be asking questions. and. We appreciate any questions that you have as we go through it. Um, when we started, we're, what we did was we started with a brand new org, and we're building on each week. So if you've missed a previous week, you can go back and watch the videos and get caught up on where we're at. We recommend that you follow along. Um, if you can do the work in your own dev org, you'll learn a lot more as we go along. And definitely, definitely bring your questions. So what we've been doing is we have this fictional company that we call Universal Boxes. They're a subsidiary to Universal Containers. And what they do is they manufacture uh, boxes for customers all around the world. So previously what we've done is we've set up the users. We've set up a security model. Um, we've customized the fields. And now we're ready to do some automation. So let's talk about the automation tools. So one of the uh, first one we're going to talk about is assignments, lead case assignments. We're going to talk about workflow rules. We'll talk about the process builder. We'll talk about flows. And then there's one more automation tool, and that's the Apex code, which we won't be talking about today, but we will talk about that in a future webinar. So let's talk about the assignment rules. So we're going to throw up one of those polls right now and ask, what objects have assignment rules? Now this one is a multiple choice, so you can pick more than one of these options. All right. While that's coming up, I am posting a link in the chat session to the webinars, to our YouTube channel. So anybody can go there and pull up our past sessions and take a look at those. All right, so it looks like 100% of you said cases. We've got orders, opportunities, accounts, and leads. Um, the correct answers are leads and cases. These are the only two objects that have assignment rules. Um, and the reason for this is that you can assign your leads or your cases to your salespeople or support people as you need it. Um, you can also assign them to queues. Assignment rules are criteria-based. 
So you can specify uh, specific criteria to assign those rules or to assign those leads and cases. And you can only have one active rule at a time. So I am going to turn it over to John and he is going to show us how to create an assignment rule. And again, as we go through this demo, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. All right. <clears throat> Make sure my screen is sharing here. Yep, the screen share came out fine. Okay. So we're going to set up an assignment rule. So we have a sales structure in the company uh, with some different regions. And so we're going to set up assignment rules based on region. <clears throat> so to start with, we're going to look at a lead real quick and we're going to see we've got our region field here. And it's a simple pick list with four different options. So we want to set it up so that when one of those options is picked, the lead gets assigned to the correct sales rep. So we're going to go under setup. We're going to use the quick find to find our assignment rules. And you'll see here, as we pull up assignment rules, as we mentioned, we've got lead and cases. And there's also topic assignment triggers. Topics are part of the knowledge, knowledge base system. It's a little bit different than assignment rules. It works very similar, but we're not going to cover that part today. <clears throat> we'll create a lead assignment rule. However, case assignment rules work exactly the same way. So we're going to give it a name. And we're going to make it active. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we've got our assignment rule. And we'll go into it here. And we need some rule entries. So you've got your rule itself, and then you need entries to define what it's actually going to do. So here we're going to create an entry. The sort order, this is strictly a number. So as you create your rule entries, your rule entries are defining what's my criteria and what's going to happen when I hit that particular criteria. And you can sort the order that these go down the list. So we're going to put this as number one since it's at the top. We're going to find our region field. And we're going to choose on here, Northwest. And we're going to assign this to the queue, Northwest Sales Queue. You could also have an email template here, which when a lead gets assigned, through this entry, it would send out this template to the people in the queue to let them know that there's a new record in their queue to look at. You can leave that blank and they'll just go into the queue and be there. We're going to hit save and new. Remember we have four different regions we need to set up here. So we're going to go to two. If you know your values, you can just type them in there. But I don't have queues set up for all the regions. So in this case, I'm actually just going to grab one of my users to assign to. And then I always go back and create my other queues and fill these in later to have the rest of them set up to queues or directly to users, whichever you'd like. Best practice would be to send them to queues instead of to users specifically. The reason is, is that if your user gets disabled, then your rule breaks and it no longer assigns. But if you assign it to queues and keep your people in the queues, then you don't have to worry about that. You can just swap your users out, assign them to the queue, and you're good. All right. 
Now we have our rule entries. And you'll see them here and it tells you which ones have an email assigned to it. <laughs> and that's it. Now our assignment rule is set up. So now what we can do is we can go back to a lead and we're going to create a new lead. And we're going to select the Northwest region here. Now I'm also going to come down here and mark this box. You'll notice it's off by default, aside using active assignment rule. You can make that on by default, and I'll show you where to do that. I'm going to save this, and now you'll see that my owner has been reassigned. Instead of to me, it's been assigned to that queue that we set up in the assignment rule. So let's go look at where to make that assignment automatically. So go back to the lead assignment rules. It's not in the assignment rules, I apologize for that. I uh, apologize, a little mind cramp this morning. I have forgotten where to set that setting. We'll continue on and I will backfill it and let you know where to set that so that you can have that on by default as you go through. Okay, Fred, we'll go back to you and continue on and we'll swing back to this in just a little bit. All right, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is the approvals process. Now, uh, what would you use an approvals process for? Um, let's say you have uh, salespeople, and if they give a discount to the customer over a certain percentage, a manager needs to approve that. Um, and maybe if it's a high enough percentage, maybe it needs to go up to a uh, one of the higher managers. So approval processes, um, they require the approval from another user. And it says here, you know, usually a manager. It can be any user. It doesn't have to be the manager. Um, they can have multiple steps and multiple criteria. So you can specify different criteria for entering the approval process. And you can make it so that the records are locked during the approval process. If the record is locked, then none of the information can be changed until the approval is completed. So we are going to now create an approval process. And our approval process that we're going to create is, as we said before, it's going to be for our salespeople, that if the discount is over a certain amount, then their manager is going to have to approve it. Um, if it's high enough, then a regional manager will have to approve it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to John and let him show us how to create that approval process. All right. So we'll create an approval process. Um, that lead assignment checkbox I had mentioned on the page layout under layout properties, right here is where you can turn on the lead assignment box to be on by default. <clears throat> All right. So as Fred mentioned, with an approval process, approval processes are under the
quicker and has fewer options listed on it. And so I'll, I'll let you go through and play with the different wizards and take a look at them as you go. So we're going to go through the standard wizard real quick. And it wants a process name, so we're going to call this Opportunity Discount. And it's always good to give it a description. Now, the criteria for entering the approval process. So what happens that causes the approval to be required? In this case, we're looking at our Opportunity Discount. And we're looking for a discount greater than 15%. Now it wants to know who your automated approver is, determined by the manager or by another field. You could set up custom fields to determine this, or you can use your hierarchy relationship of the roles in your company. In this case, we're just going to do it by the manager. And on here, record editability, administrators only can edit records during the approval process or administrators or the current assigned prover can edit the record. So this allows us to control what Fred mentioned, when you enter an approval process, you can lock the record down so no changes can be made. Administrators can always make changes to those locked records. You can also set this, allows administrators and whoever is waiting to approve it, that ability to edit the record. So this will allow our manager access to edit the record if they want to when they are working on it. This is the email template that is going to go to the person that is being asked to give the approval. So we're going to pick our email template there. And that is optional. You do not have to have email templates. This is asking which fields you want to display on the approval page. So in this case, we've got the opportunity to name the owner. We also want to give them the close date, the discount, because that's what's determining the approval. And we're going to throw the amount in the account on there for them. And then you could reorder how those show. And we're going to give them the approval history as well. You'll see there's lots of options here. We want to allow them to use it through a mobile device with the Salesforce One app as well. So we're going to turn that on. Now we want to know who are the initial submitters? Who is allowed to submit an approval for this item? So in this case, the opportunity owner is correct. So we're going to leave that. We're going to add the related list to the page layout. And we're going to allow our submitters to recall the request. So if somebody submits a request for approval, allow them to pull it back and make changes and then resubmit it later. Now it needs an approval step. We're going to create a step here. We're calling this the low discount. We've got two levels of discounts that we're looking at. So this is step number one. And we're going to say all records coming into the approval process should enter this step. We're going to use the manager. Uh, the delegate is each user can have a delegated approver. And this would allow that delegated approver to also approve this request. So we're going to go ahead and enable that here as well. Now we need some action. What's going to happen when they approve or reject this item? So we're going to set the approval 
and we're going to send out an email alert when this is approved. So we're going to say first level approved, and we're going to send this to a related user. Let's see. The owner. We want to send this to the, the opportunity owner. You can send it to additional users as well. You'll see as I come through here, it'll hold the opportunity owner. I could also send it to the last modified or to a group or what, however you would like to structure that. Or you can just hard code emails right into the step. And then we're going to save that. So now in saving that, this is taking us to the approval process screen. So this is the main approval process. You'll see here's our entry criteria for the process itself and all those options that we set. It's not active yet. You'll see initial submission actions. It locks the record. And here's our steps that we've got. So we've got our approval step with the email alert. Now we're going to add a rejection action. We're going to add an email alert here. And we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to say a low discount tonight. Send it to the owner. Show our actions again. And we're also going to add a field update here. With the discount being rejected, we are actually going to remove the discount from the opportunity. So we're just going to set it to blank. I'll save that. There's your approval process. At this point, you can simply activate it, and it's ready to go. Um, however, in this case, we want to add one more step. And we'll do this very quickly. This will be step number two. And this is going to be if the discount goes greater than 30%. And in this case, we want the CEO to be approving this one. And we're not going to let the delegated approver approve this one. This is something the CEO has to sign off on, and we're going to allow that permission to edit as well. Well, and again, we're going to going to set up that same email alert. In this case, we're going to send it to both the owner and the last modified. And we'll save that. Now we're back here, and you'll see we've got our two different steps here. We've got actions for step one and actions for step two. I'm going to add another field update to this rejection. However, for step two, I'm going to add an existing field update because I want to do the same field update that we did on the previous one. So we'll pull that one over. 
and now we've got that same thing happening here. You can also add final approval actions and rejection actions. So once the full process is completed, you can add different actions to happen there and recall actions. If it's recalled, what happens? In this case, it'll unlock it. And you'll see here on the final rejection, it's going to unlock. But on the final approval actions, it's keeping that record rock, lock so it can't be edited. There's different things you can do there to control that. In this case, all we care about is that discount field. Um, you could use a series of record types and page layouts to still allow the record to unlock, but keep that discount field locked. So, John, we've got a question here. Okay. Um, we're doing this approval process on the opportunity. Uh, the question is, can we also create an approval process for individual line items on the opportunity? Yes, you can. Uh, let me show you. We're going to go back to the approval process list. And all you do is you go back to your approval processes for and go to And I don't see it there. There should be an opportunity product section there. It might be done. I apologize, I don't know off the top of my head. We're going to try this real quick. Um, this is something that has been done before. something's missing in our org. With a new org setup, sometimes you run into little things like this where something may not be fully active and set up. It's there. I might have to look just a little bit, but I, I know there's a couple of ways you can do this. One option would be to create a roll-up field on your opportunity that would pull your discounts off the line items. And I've done this before where I had a requirement one time where somebody said, if a line item discount gets higher than 15%, then it goes into approval. So what we did is we set a roll-up on the opportunity that pulled off the line items, the highest discount off the line items, and then we triggered our approval process off that roll-up field. So that is one way you could do it off of roll-up fields, um, and there's different ways to manage that. You can also do the same thing with quotes and quote line items, um, but I think you'll have to do it off of roll-ups, it looks like. We don't have direct access to those uh, line item records for the approval process itself, but roll-ups will work. Okay, wonderful. Great question. Thank you. And that's a note of to try to throw up a quick little uh, YouTube video showing how to do that, just a little five-minute video that shows how to do something like that. So. All right, real quick, one last thing. Let's activate this process and show you what it looks like in action real quick here. So we've got it activated now. We're going to go to an opportunity. We're going to throw this on here, and we're going to give it a 16% discount with a close date of next month, and we'll throw it in qualification stage. Save that. And now we've got our opportunity. It's got a high discount, and it needs to be approved. So at this point, it will have to be manually approved, which you would do just by clicking the Submit for Approval button. You can automate this process, and we may show that to you at a later time as well. You'll notice now that it shows the record is locked with an unlock record button 
admin or whoever is being requested to do the approval. Under the approval history, you'll see it shows the status is pending and it's giving us the approve reject options. The approve and reject options will only show up for people that have access to approve or reject that process. And here's the screen that they get with the fields that we gave them and a section for comments. We're going to say this customer does not qualify and reject it. And you'll see now in the approval history it was rejected and there's the comments of why. And you'll notice it is now unlocked and ready to be used. So there's approval processes. A uh, real quick run through on it. Like I said, we'll take a note to do some smaller YouTube videos to put up on our channel uh, with some more information about doing the line items um, and some other features within the process itself. All right, John, uh, one more question here before we move on. Okay. Um, in what scenarios would you want to unlock the records after you, the approval process, after they've been approved? Um, you would want to unlock it in scenarios like I was mentioning where in this case the only field we care about is the discount. So you would want to be able to unlock the record for other things to be done with the opportunity um, other than just keeping that discount field locked and there's uh, that may be something we'll have to circle back another session and show how to do that with record types and page layouts too. But that would really be the scenario is that after the approval, there may need to be more edits made to the record. So you want to be careful with that. Most of the time, it's going to stay locked once approved so that no changes can be made. And you can deal with internal processes on how to deal with that. All right. N another excellent question. Let's move on to our next step. All right. All right. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is the workflows, um, and when we would use these. And, and again, we'll we'll build out a basic workflow. Um, workflows. You can repeat simple tasks, such as uh, if the case is marked as a feature request, we're going to send an email to marketing and close the case. And this is the workflow that we're actually going to build today. Um, with workflows, you can only do uh, cross objects with a mass tail relationship. You can only run one criteria at a time, but you can run multiple actions from one criteria. So we'll go ahead and jump right to the demo of that. All right, so as we mentioned, we're going to set up a workflow on our cases. We want our case, if a case gets marked with the type of feature request, we want to notify marketing that we've got a feature request and close the case. There's nothing else to do with it. So we'll go under setup. Again, this is under build, create, and workflows and approvals, and there's your workflow rules. And that's a screen that just kind of talks about it. You can get rid of that if you'd like. We're going to build a new rule. Some of this will look similar to what we just did with approval processes too. The criteria screen throughout Salesforce is pretty consistent. So we're going to choose our object, our case in this, on this one. We're going to give it a name. And I'm going to name it. Now I do this type of naming convention just to help make it easier. If I get a bunch of workflow rules, I want to be able to find them easily. And so coming up with a naming convention will help keep your system organized for you. Again, descriptions are always recommended just to help know what's going on in your system. Evaluate the rule when when it's created, when it's created and every time it's edited or created and any time it's edited to subsequently meet the criteria. And you want to know which item to choose 
uh, just think about exactly what your criteria is. This last item basically means that if my record hits the criteria for this rule, I'm going to run it. The next time it hits that criteria, it's not going to run again because it was already done once. If I want it to meet the criteria every time it's edited, then we'll choose this one. Notice you cannot do time-dependent workflow actions with this option. And that's what we're going to do on this one because we're not doing time-dependent on this particular case. So here's our criteria. You can also choose formula and create a formula here that will determine what to run. In this case, we're just going to do a simple criteria of the case type equals feature request, and we'll save it. At this point, the workflow rule has been created. Now it wants us to put an action on here. Okay, so we've got feature requests. What am I supposed to do with it? Excuse me. We're going to send an email alert. And this will look familiar from something that we just did. <clears throat> You'll choose your email template. And then I choose who you want to send it to. In this case, I would probably send it to a group. I don't have a group set up right now, so I'm going to send it to a role instead. And I'm just going to find my marketing role. Send it to the marketing manager. And again, I'm not assigning to a specific user, so I don't have to worry about constantly changing my system when my users change out. And we'll save that. Now we also want to close the case at this point. So we're going to do a field update. And we're going to choose the case status. And we're going to pick a specific value of closed and save it. And now we're done. Again, notice it is not active automatically. You have to activate it when you're ready. So we're going to go ahead and activate that. And we're going to go to our case. So we've got our case here. And if it fits the criteria, we'll mark it as feature request. We'll save it. And I can't show you the email because it's, it doesn't log the email itself. But you will notice that the status is now closed. And I can assure you the email did go out. Another thing that I like to do in these scenarios is um, on that workflow rule, I'll add another action that logs an activity to the case so that I can see that the email was sent out. Okay. All right. Before we move into the next one, we had a question. Um, if we have an existing or a planned video tutorial uh, that goes deeper into the queues in Salesforce, and what we do is we have a list of topics, um, and we will be creating three to five minute video, YouTube videos on those topics. So we have added cues to our topics list and we'll be adding that to YouTube in the coming uh, weeks. All right. So the next uh, automation tool that we are going to talk about is the process builder. And as you've noticed, we're slowly getting into a little bit more complex. We started with the really easy automation tools and we're moving towards the more complex ones. Um, the process, process builder allows you to do cross-object updates. Um, you can do multiple criteria. 
Um, it uses a basic if-then structure. If, if this field equals this, then perform this task. Um, you can perform more actions in the workflow rules. Um, however, with the process builder, when you do bulk uh, data loads, if you have the process builder on it, can um, break those data loads because of the Salesforce limits. So again, we are going to jump back into Salesforce and we are going to create a process builder. I'm going to turn it back over to John. All right, oops. I think I hit the wrong button there. Hang on. Okay. So we're going to go back to the opportunities for this one. And for for this scenario, we're going to create a process builder that has two stages to it, two steps to it, which would normally be two different workflow rules, but in this case we get to combine them and put them into one place. So what we're going to do is if the opportunity goes to a closed one, then we're going to create a new record for the order fulfillment team. If we go to closed loss, we're going to send an email to the sales manager. So let's go into building our process builder. We'll go back to setup. Again, under create workflows and approvals, and we're going to go to process builder. And this has a completely new screen that is going to pull up. You'll see it kind of goes to its own little world here. We're going to go new, and we're going to give it a name. Here's our process builder screen. Now, as we go through this, I'll point it out, but there's a couple of sections on this where once you've set something, you cannot change it. You'll have to start all over with a new process builder if you need to. The first one of those is the object. Once you have set the object, you cannot change it. You'll have to create a new process builder in order to change it. So in this case, we're going to say on the opportunity, and we're going to say when it's created or edited, You'll see the criteria for the if-then type structure is kind of similar to workflow rules. Under advanced, here's that same option that we had before that will allow it to run again if need be. Honestly, it's a pretty fairly or rarely used option in our experience. So we're going to save this, and that locks us to the opportunity. We can't change the opportunity, but we can change when the process starts. Now we need our criteria. What's our criteria? So we're going to look at our first section here. So we're going to say this is a closed one. So I'm going to say when the conditions are met or a formula, or you can say no criteria, just execute an action for me. In this case, we're going to do conditions are met. We're going to say when our stage equals and you'll see there's lots of options here. Pick list, you can reference another field, you can set a global value, or you can use a formula to determine what you want here. In this case, we're just going to say closed one. If you have multiple conditions here, you can do an and, or, or even customize your logic. So you can set up all sorts of crazy criteria here to run this. We'll save this. And we're going to add an action. In this case, we're going to create a new record. So we'll find our object here, order fulfillment. And now it's giving us our fields from 
the order fulfillment, what do we need to set? So we're going to set our, our number of units, our opportunity IDs. So in here, if you have your opportunity set up, then you could just go to reference and find your field. So I'm going to go off the opportunity itself, and I'm going to say, I don't have it. I didn't build the fields, I apologize for that, but I could have a field here to pull in my number of units, and again, that could pull off of your opportunity product quantities uh, by using a roll-up to the opportunity. For this example, we'll just Hard set it. Now the opportunity ID I definitely want to reference. So I'm going to hit this. I'm going to find my opportunity ID field and set that. And then you can add more fields pulled off of your order fulfillment record. Now to explain what happened here just a little bit, these fields that are pulled up automatically are the fields that are required in order to create this record. The rest of them are optional fields. So in this case, I'm going to pull the owner ID. So I'm going to go to owner ID, and you'll notice the little arrow next to it means it's going to pop up a new drop-down list here and let me dial down into the other object. So I can pull the user ID for this one. And you can keep going and fill out all of your fields for that record. So we're going to save this. And that will now, when we go to close one, it's going to automatically create that order fulfillment record for us. Now the second part was if we go to closed lost. So we're going to create a new criteria here. Again, we're going to set our stage to closed lost. And we're going to say we're going to do an email alert. Now you'll notice it says find an email alert. You can simply start typing and it will show you existing email alerts in the system. But we don't have one yet, so we need to create one. So we'll hit the link there, and now we're going to go to the email alert section, section and create a new email alert here. This is coming off of an opportunity. And you would choose your template itself. So you see there's a number of pre predefined things that you'll have to do in order for this to fully function here. And we want this to go to the sales manager. So we're going to go to the role here and send it up to the general manager on this case. Now we've got our email alert. And I will save that. And while that's saving, John, we've got a question here. Um, is it possible to use the field of another object as the criteria? Yes, actually it is. Let's just for fun, let's add a new criteria here. And let's look at the account type just for fun. So let's say we want to look at what is my account type. So it's the same thing here. Anytime you see this arrow, it means you can drill down into a new account or into a different object. So in this case, now I'm looking at the account fields, and I can go account type. 
and I can say if this is other. And then I can save that and then I can perform an action based off of that. So yeah, any, this is one of the strengths of process builder over workflow rules. Workflow rules are stuck to parent-child relationships for going across object. Process builder can reach across any linked object. So as long as there's a lookup field on your main object, so in this case opportunity, then I can reach into any linked object through those lookup fields and use criteria, I can perform actions, I can do updates, anything you want to do to those related objects, you can trigger right off, right off of this. Excellent question, thank you. Okay, and one more kind of a follow-up question to that. Can we perform an action on another object as well? Yes, absolutely. Let's actually on this closed loss, let's add a new action here. And we're going to do, I'm going to say I'm going to do an update record. And just for fun, this may be a bad example, but we're going to update the account description. So you'll notice here it says select the opportunity record or select a related record. So I'm going to go to related record. And again, I get that same type of drill list here. So I can say account. And we'll go to the notes field. Choose that. And now it wants me to choose what am I going to update here. I could, instead of going to the notes, I could just go to the account and say the account ID. And it might take a little bit of playing around to get used to all the options in here and what to pick where. There's my account description. And I could just do a string, which means whatever I type in here, that's what's going to populate. Or I can do a reference, something else again, the global constant or a formula to create whatever I want to on there. Another excellent question, thank you. Uh, any other questions that we've got here? Looks like that's all the questions so far. Uh, we've had okay. some great questions today. And we're running a little bit short on time, so we're going to very quickly talk about the flows. So flows are a little bit more complex. They are basically quick coding. Um, if you've ever seen a flow chart, if you've ever done a flow chart, you can do flows. Um, they can run very complex automations. They can be linked together. And they have to be fired from either a process builder, code, or a button or link. Um, flows allow you to do very customized development without getting into code. Um, there are, we found there are some times when it gets a little bit more complex that you don't want to use flows just because it's a little bit harder to maintain on the very complex situations. But on the simpler ones, uh, flows are an excellent alternative to actually writing code. And most admins can do flows. Um, again, due to we're kind of running out of time, so we're not going to do a demo on this. One last thing that we wanted to show you, this chart comes from help.salesforce.com and it shows the difference in the different automation tools and what you can do. So if you're looking for to do some kind of automation, this is a great resource. So finishing up this week, um, next week we are going to be going more into those, um, let's see, we did Click auto. This is not the right slide. John, what are we doing next week? 
Let me take a quick look. I believe next week we are actually going to go deeper into flow. So next week we will actually go through uh, the flow tool itself and how to build a flow and what that does. Okay, so this actually is, uh, next week is a continuation of this week, and we'll really be diving into those flows and showing you how to build those. Um, so join us again next week at the same time, um, and we will be going into that. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will uh, see you next week.